Hello, everybody. Welcome to this latest episode of the Prime Venture Partners podcast, where we bring you um, stories from entrepreneurs and others in the startup ecosystem. Uh, and uh, today I have uh, a fellow portfolio company of Prime, uh, founder Kushal Rastogi of Night Fintech. Uh, Kushal, welcome to the show. Hi, hi. Thanks, Sanjay, for having me here. Hi, everyone. Great. So, uh, Kushal runs um, the co-founder of Night Fintech, which is a uh, technology platform for um, banks and BFCs, uh, helping them revamp and make this transition to becoming uh, more nimble and, st- and smarter uh, as uh, the world goes more digital. Uh, I'll, I'll have Kushal talk a little bit about his background and about the company and you know, some of the insights and lessons learned over the first few years of the company. So Kushal, maybe we can start with uh, a little bit about your background and uh, perhaps you know, your co-founder Parthesh's background and a quick introduction to what is Night Fintech. Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjay, for, for having us here. And, and it's, it has been like truly a pleasure to you know, work with Prime for the last few years. Uh, my name is Kushal. I'm founder and CEO of Night Fintech. I'm an IT grad 2008 batch. And most of the last 14 years have been working at the cross-section of technology and finance. Prior to starting Night Fintech, I was working with a European hedge fund, uh, which was, I worked there for about four and a half years, where I was essentially working as a system architect, building uh, trading systems, managing billions and dollars of assets, which is a multi-asset global portfolio. Uh, in terms of large chunk of the portfolio was geared towards fixed income. Having said that, we traded pretty much everything under the sun across commodities, equities, currencies, and everything. The, the ideology was largely quantitative and mathematics driven, right? So we used to leverage the AI and quant and used to, you know, kind of harness a large amount of financial markets data and build the insights either from the, from the trading opportunities perspective or from a risk management perspective. My co-founder Parthish, who is not joined this podcast. Again, I know him for now over 12 years. Uh, there's an interesting piece on how we know each other from the time that we both are engineers and we both moved to finance. So from our, uh, essentially from our, uh, we can say struggle days, when you used to struggle to switch from finance to technology, uh, from, uh, from engineering to finance, that has been the time that we know each other. And so about his background, so he is again, SP Gen computer science grad. And initially he was working with Deloitte, then he moved to real-time trading systems called RTS, a German tech company, which was working into the high frequency trading domain and uh, which eventually got acquired by Bloomberg. So both of us, while I was largely on the buy side, working at a European fund and managing the assets and building the systems and building the algorithms, he was on the other side where he was actually working and interfacing the large institutional clients, like the Goldman's and Credit Suisse of the world, and actually selling them the financial systems and the solutions. But we both have been living for the last 10, 12 years uh, inside the, you know, the ecosystem of how these large uh, financial institutions work and while what we have seen from the inside, from the outside, obviously people have a certain perception about how a large financial institution would work. And that's where we saw the opportunities, the gaps, and we saw that this is massive. And uh, from that's from where the idea came that why don't we join hands and basically start something uh, which basically solves for their hard problems. That's how so the tell us a little bit about... Uh... Uh, it's, a, it's a great background. Would love to hear the anecdote, perhaps, about uh, how you and Patesh know each other. But yeah, I do, yeah. you know, I do recall, I mean, in the early days, also the, just this whole, even for us as investors, though we work in the space, uh, the transition of, you know, we understand technology and some of the use cases and the applications you shared with us were still quite Greek and Latin, I would say, and still probably is a little bit of that. Uh, but tell us a little bit about um, the company, perhaps, you know, uh, what's the area that you are focusing in and, uh, um, you know, and the problems you're trying to solve and, and who your customers are. Sure. Thanks, Sanjay. So at Night Fintech, we are aiming to transform banking infrastructure. We are building a specialized bank infrastructure layers on top of their legacy systems or the core systems, right? Trying to mod- trying to convert these legacy systems to modern and agile systems. We all understand that majority of the systems are a bit archaic and and replacing them is something which is a very difficult decision for anybody. While everybody 
faces certain challenges into their day-to-day -day operations, whether it's related to operations, customers, or the regulatory. And that's where we kind of sit in, in, on top of it. These layers are kind of dedicated towards the specialized use cases. The first and the primary use cases we built for was Treasury, where obviously we both had significant experience, operating experience of ourselves. Uh, in, in the initial avatar of the business, we were actually working with the mid-sized portfolio managers who used to manage $50, $100 million in assets. We used to help them in terms of from an infrastructure side of it, that how do they manage the assets, manage market risk, customer servicing, et cetera. But later on, we kind of evolved that, you know, the large banks, mid-sized banks and the corporates, they also have huge amount of treasury and, and there was a lot of gaps. Uh, we were surprised to see, uh, you know, a lack of crores of uh, treasury amount was being managed into Excel sheets. And we felt that there is a large opportunity. Uh, and, and I think anybody from MDs to head of risk are interested in basically having a better transparency, better audit trails of what is happening actually. And which is a very sizable part of the balance sheet, which is close to one third. So that, that the initial uh, use case, which was, came very natural to us was treasury. And then as we were deeper into the treasury, there was a natural progression from treasury to the other opportunities, which was the lending related infrastructure. But from the day one, we have been focused onto the banking infrastructure. And, and we are trying to solve the problems, which are something that we can solve for, which our customers want us to provide solution for, and where we have some sort of a winning edge. That's what we are attacking for. Wonderful. So, so for me to just paraphrase it, basically you're saying all of the ba banks have got, you know, certain uh, circa of, of technology stacks to, for, for solving their problems. And you feel there is a big opportunity to revamp and upgrade these, uh, these systems. And the first place you attack was treasury because of your background um, and treasury in the smaller banks was largely run on, run on spreadsheet technology. And so that's the first one where you felt uh, there was a use case. Uh, but you very quickly, uh, you know, started to get a lot more uh, exciting traction in recent uh, quarters, especially as in last year or so in the lending space, right? And so tell us what's going on because you also have some fairly large banks now as clients in the lending space. Uh, what are some of the exciting developments that are happening and what is driving that? Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Sanjay. So if we if we basically look at there are multiple things which are happening into the lending space, particularly. So as we said, we first talked about the bank infra. The infrastructure is internal to the systems also and to the outside parties also. Right. So, for example, when a bank wants to do business with a fintech or a banks want to do business with an NBFC, what we realize that there is a lot of investment and a lot of innovation has happened into the consumer facing layer. Where, where people have worked upon hard to how do how they efficiently acquire the customers, how they minimize the CAD and the better customer experience. So the user experience has solved for, but at the, at the, the second point, uh, basically uh, for, for the tunnel is the bank infrastructure, which are the legacy systems, which we felt was severely underinvested and, uh, and the innovation was the need of an art. So we started building that infrastructure, even the extended infrastructure that builds the pipes between these n number of fintechs and nbfcs and the banks and when we started to do that we saw that magic started to happen uh, the acceptance was very fast the momentum was very fast and there are like again deeper reasons we can get into that that why it is driving so so whether it's a regulator themselves whether it's the finance ministry or the bank stock management there is a clear push towards the co-lending and we started to become you know the kind of market leader into the co-lending infrastructure provider probably we are the only one into the industry today who has the full stack co-lending stack from an infrastructure perspective. Got it. So I, I think you're making a very subtle point here, which is that banks are now starting to definitely realize that partnering with others, whether it is an NBFC or a FinTech is the wave of the future here and they have to coexist with them, which is actually exciting for, uh, for FinTechs. But as investors in, in several other fintechs also, one of the things we have always found is the business teams are happy to partner with the, uh, with, the, with the startups, but then the ability to onboard the startup and actually go live is, is often you know, a huge, huge barrier. Uh, and very, even some of the more advanced NBFCs, very few of them have, re, have really state-of-the-art, you know, new age APIs and stuff like that. So 
and I'm, I'm guessing, I mean, please uh, feel free to correct or elaborate from what you're saying, <clears throat> your solution goes in there and, and enables the banks to be much more nimble and much more ready to onboard new fintechs, onboard new NBFCs and work with them in, in uh, thing. Maybe you can dive in a little bit more because many of our uh, audience are actually fintechs who might be the beneficiaries of, uh, of your platform as well. So yeah. maybe with a few anecdotal examples of, you know, some of the things that that they have to do, which are challenging in today's environment and, and how with your infrastructure in place, they become a lot more uh, uh, doable. Sure. So as you mentioned, so primarily we are positioned as the infrastructure player and we are building the use cases on top of the infrastructure. So the core infrastructure is where we something called as the universal core banking adapter, which we have built, which sits on top of the core banking solutions of the banks. We have already deeply integrated with Pinnacle. We are already live with a couple of banks. We are already under the implementation with deep integration with TCS Bank, also with Oracle Flex Cube. So all three put together, we practically cover nearly all of the large banks where we are out of box compatible. Now this starts to bring in a very interesting synergies between the fintechs and BFCs and the banks who both want to work together. And we can, from a business side, I think everybody agree and we can again speak at length that why there is a business case that they want to do business together. But I'm talking primarily from a product and infrastructure perspective that what were the key challenges they were facing, right? So, th so the, they have two options. Either they do a point-to-point -point or a one-to-one -one direct integration, which is by definition inefficient. There is a lot of resources to be put in. The GTM becomes six, nine months, sometimes even 12 months for a FinTech to do a direct integration with the bank. It's again inefficient, it takes more time, more resources, more cost. At the same time for a FinTech, if they're doing integration with one bank, it is not reusable. If they have to do that integration with other bank, they have to do the exercise again. And these integrations could be agnostic to use cases. The use case could be lending, co-lending. The use case could be for a new bank where they are sourcing for CASA, FD, or a use case could be for even credit cards. For different use cases at the end of the day, they have to interface with the core banking systems of the bank. From a bank's perspective, banks are not willing uh, from a security perspective also that they will not be able to open their core banking systems to the whole world. And, and, and I think all of us understand this TBS systems are kind of held into a very secured way. They're sitting inside the MZ room where there is no access to internet or even, you know, the kind of right. direct line. Even the bank users can't access it. So, you know, so there is, you know, a lot of security layers have to be built in. Then there is the VAPT and all those kinds of vetting security checks have to happen before bank attests some system to communicate to them. These are the, the natural friction points into the overall system. How we are kind of positioning at ourselves is, kind of building that infrastructure layer, building that infrastructure fabric, which is on one hand connecting and having a deep integration with those banks. And on the other hand, doing those integrations with the NBFCs and FinTechs. So without actually replacing a core infrastructure, the thick systems inside the bank, we are building those thin layers on top of the existing infrastructure, which suddenly and magically becomes compatible to do business with all the FinTechs and NBFCs, which is much more secure, much more efficient, can be reused hundreds of times, Bank has an incentive as they get integrated, they can do business with hundreds of NBFCs and NBFCs have the, or the fintechs, and they have the incentive that if they get integrated with us, they can actually do business with some of the biggest lenders. As a matter of fact, as we speak today. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, good. Yeah, so if we, as a matter of fact, if we speak today in terms of the ecosystem enabler, uh, the kind of uh, large banks, both public and private sector, even if I exclude the, you know, the certain pipeline that we have, the signed contracts, the signed banks, and the signed NBFCs, they together control approximately 32 lakh crores in assets, which is more than a quarter of the overall banking. So, so we are able to create that network and we're able to build that network of the fintechs and NBFC where there is a lot of value to, to, to which can be unleashed over a period of time. So that, that's uh, quite fascinating. And one of the analogies I was thinking could be sort of almost like a payment gateway, right? Where uh, uh, if you see the banks did have the abilities to you know, process the payments, but the it was always you know, very inconvenient for merchants to have to integrate with the banks and the bank payment gateway itself out of the box probably was fairly rudimentary, right? And it was literally a thin layer over the payment switch. And companies like uh, CC Avenue in the early days and then later on Razor Pay and uh, uh, others in that category, and of course, Razor Pay is now a dominant player here, have built sort of a layer with a very developer-friendly uh, uh, interface 
the business relationship still has to happen between the the business and uh, and the banks or maybe in some cases you know the payment gateway providers are also aggregating that part or you know uh, of the business uh, negotiations but fundamentally at a technology level they've built this layer that makes it easy for the um, uh, for technology based companies in this case that it with the customers to to interface with the banks and i think what you're saying here is for the banks it's actually both an opportunity but a headache to have to deal with so many uh, partners and from the partners perspective also it's a headache to do custom integration with each of the banks and then you're building that sort of uh, middleware there uh, so tell us uh, to the extent you can share you know uh, what are some of the things that are now possible and from a regulatory perspective right i mean if you think about it from a large banks perspective and several customer uh, several listeners in our audience are you know entrepreneurs who are trying to build perhaps analogous products and 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 services and and sell them to to banks you have kind of managed to over uh, for a very young company you know convince a lot of these large banks that they should be opening up connectivity to the core banking system and and you know allowing you to build the sort of api layer now it's a pretty big decision for a bank uh, to have to make uh, right what does it take uh, to get into the level of you know trust and confidence for a large enterprise to say oh you know i should be working with a young company like this right what are some of the challenges how do you go about addressing them uh, and um, uh, you know how has it worked out for the company yeah thanks anjay i think it's a great question and and if i try to combine it so i think a lot of things have to basically fall in place to you know things start to work right so so yes as you rightly mentioned in terms of building the credibility and trust because these large financial institutions they they look a lot so in terms of you know the credibility and what they have what we have done so i think over the last two years what we have built you know like empowering over 35 small banks and managing the infrastructure at least for the one third of the balance sheet or so uh i think that also you know kinds of gives them a certain comfort that we understand banking we understand regulations and we understand the security and the compliance and we are that serious about it so that is one part of it so let's actually re rewind the clock a couple of years right because yeah. even what you have done with the small banks to build your sort of i mean what you're saying is look okay, we earned some credibility by working first with the small banks before we could break into the big banks but let's start there right how does one even earn the credibility for the small banks because they're just small in relative terms right but otherwise regulating compliance requirement wise etc they are their banks right so do share especially since it was during the pandemic you know and you couldn't even meet them uh, face to face half the time right so do tell us about some of those stories uh, yeah i think uh, i think those were you know quite interesting days because we were working into a segment which was which was not that much tech savvy and uh, and where we used to do a lot of things in terms of actually telling them people how to use zoom probably you know we made a lot of people uh, you know probably zoom should be giving us you know some sort of referral a lot of new customers and a lot of you know new stuff we used to do <laughs> that was and... the business model then we get a referral <laughs> from zoom <laughs> Yeah, so no. We actually, yeah, maybe we can start. You know, just describe perhaps the yeah. type of customer. You know, the cooperative banks that you had started working with, um, and then you know, yes, the, some of these experiences I thought they were fascinating that you were telling me of them. Right. So, so most of, uh, especially if you look at the small banks and banking in general, is a very much relationship driven. Right. People like to, and especially when you're talking about the decision makers, that they want you to be sit in front of them, and probably you know, you get to date three, four, five meetings. and then something happens right so obviously you have to and that's a kind of a mindset and especially when we we used to work with the smaller banks which had a typical balance sheet from anywhere from 50 100 million dollars to maybe going up to the billion dollars in assets right now we're talking about the banks which are like much larger in terms of a balance sheet maybe up to 10 lakh crores in balance sheet right so we kind of graduated to certain extent to work right from the the small uh, small community banks or cooperative banks to going up to the private sector and the some of the biggest public sector banks also so that is how the journey has been over the last two and a half years but even for for when we were starting you know like for the first time building those kind of meetings things started to happen i think i think the strategy was good in terms of how we were able to get somebody who is a you know kind of a common trust right so they trust somebody and that person trust us because because either they are the experienced bankers or they are the retired rbi or things like that so we kind of you know kind of we were really involved into the ecosystem 
and where they you know they didn't see us as aliens that we so come but somebody has come from mumbai with suits and all and you know they started selling something and which will probably disappear after selling of the systems right so i think i think that human relationship and trust was built and for that they gave us the opportunity we had the people from uh, from their community right so people they who can speak their language who who stay there so we had kind of an even from a covid we got those kind of a tailwinds we actually end up having you know kind of a distributed office right we proper the scale we had we were actually running effectively seven eight offices uh, in terms of you know where we had the small sales people and they were able to build those relationships from there you started get the the early traction and and then there was a very strong word of mouth and i think especially in an enterprise building that trust and when the customer says to the to their other peers that these guys are good and they have actually done something meaningful where they have got benefited then that that momentum has started to build in and we and we saw even from the push we we saw the transition happening towards a pull we started doing this lot of podcast and these kind of activities uh, and you know people people really actually started following that okay who are these people where they are sitting and they used to forward to the whatsapp and everything the people actually came inbound that from where these people are and what they are educating and people got a lot of benefit uh, and it was a more of a like kind of a service that they are able to get benefited uh where we had no commercial interest while people saved actually crores and crores of rupees because of that so actually that i recall was a very interesting uh, moment as well right i remember uh, talking about the idea on a tuesday with you and then by that friday you had uh, you know started um, sort of with some you know draft uh, content and then from the following week and i recall that mon- next monday you launched the service uh and you know we were looking at even before we could even find a proper name for it you know it was up and running and it has continued kind of non stop since then right the, the little Correct. baby snippet that you were putting out tell us Correct. about that uh, because i think that for our listeners would be very cool right because you kind of very subtly started a marketing uh, program uh, right which which involved giving as you said you know crores and crores of uh, rupees of value to some of your customers without even or some of your listeners without it them ever becoming customers right and so tell us a little bit about that and you know how that paid off over time right so i think it uh, it paid off in terms of building the brand right so so if i think uh, while we might have 50 or 100 customers but we know that okay 500 people are following us almost daily these are the 500 banks and uh, and their top management their mds their head of treasury is like people who are responsible to move 500 crores uh, in in basically in months time right so and sometimes their daily trading volume is over 100 crores so these are the kind of people who are following and if some if if and and, and they've seen for every single week there is an auction people come and people try to understand what we should be doing so i think what happened that a the brand got built people started to trust the brand they recognize the brand if we walk into uh, any bank we were not required to give an introduction especially parthe so everybody knew him and his uh-huh. friends and we started building even further to build our vernacular content where we started building into the regional languages also because people appreciated people in kare so we went one step ahead also to build that connect to build that trust and to establish ourselves as a subject matter expert that naturally started to see that okay if these guys are for free are able to you know give us this much of a value and benefit Uh, then you know if we actually go with you know in a scientific way and kind of help in terms of what is the regulatory pressure so how they can cut down the regulatory areas because rbi is behind with most of the banks is small or big doesn't matter and the rbi is also very smart in the way they operate so the first they will do the subtle where they will put some no some remarks basically during the audits then the next time they will start putting the penalties and the third time they will start putting some restrictions into certain activities right so mm-hmm. so as rbi was also Uh, you know tightening the grip and at the same time we were able to establish ourselves into you know the certain territory that is that helped a lot in terms of building that momentum and you know, sort of kind of having a clear leadership position where the people were not not comparing us with anybody else and we were not like just a software vendor right because they were seeing us much more than that they look up to us in terms of these are the subject matter experts they understand what they're talking about and uh, and they are working in their own interest and and the cost of the system was kind of peanuts as compared to you know what the value it was creating whether it was generating more returns or it was whether reducing the risk we have seen over the last 2 years the rate cycles right from demand 
when you from basically from six point something going up to eight percent and then going again. So when you see this kind of one fifty two hundred basis point movement into the interest rate market, and then your average duration is over five year, over five or seven years, then you see you know their their actual portfolio is moving more than five to ten percent. So for a hundred crore portfolio, it's a ten crore of risk value at risk, right? So that is the kind of risk they are always carrying. And some of them are running actually tens and thousands of crores of treasury. So there is a large amount of risk which they are carrying, which surprisingly many of them don't even understand. That Part because because people think it's a fixed income, there is no risk. You are getting a fixed coupon, and there is no risk. But but there is a risk, and you know when and especially again when you see the interest rate hike starts to happen. Uh, in in a declining interest rate, everybody is making money. When the when the interest rate starts to rise, then the real value comes. Uh, there was a time when there was series of defaults into the credit market, right? Right from LTCO, ILFS, all of those things. We had the zero default in our portfolio. We were running that time about two thousand crore plus portfolio. So those were all the things where that entire thing, uh, that all sequence of events, helped in building the trust and uh, and establishing as, as ourselves as the brand. and as a subject matter expert and after that sales was more of like you know just a process that it just happens naturally got it so that the summary uh, powerful insights there in terms of how do you establish trust how do you uh, and at the end of the day you still have to you know uh, walk the talk right so you can you can do all the marketing you want but the product has to deliver and and, and that just takes time in some of these businesses um so let's uh, fast forward now to today coming back to the whole you know co lending space where you're seeing a lot of momentum with the larger banks right um <clears throat> what is co lending at a high level right uh, we, you know we talked a little bit about partnering with ndfcs and fintechs but co lending itself why is it so nuanced and why are existing you know banks have been having loan management systems and platforms and ai based systems for underwriting risk and things like that for the past you know several years uh why has co lending become such a difficult problem to solve and why does it need you know new infrastructure to to address the challenges right so um, so i think let's maybe go step by step that what the co lending is why why you know the kind of there is a lot of momentum from from across the board whether it's a regulatory government top management or everybody why the entire business is trying to chase co lending and and then what are the specific challenges into co lending and how tech can solve for it right so if we if we speak very simply in simple terms of co-lending you can have a narrow definition and a broader definition so in the narrow definition co-lending we are talking about where the two lenders are joining hands and lending together right one is the nbfc and other is the bank they would have you know a pre agreed uh, lending framework so they agree to so so they agree to uh, basically source and lend into a pre agreed risk framework the risk policy is agreed upon works slightly differently than into a dsa model where dsa is sourcing into certain fashion and the bank where the rejection rates could be significantly higher now co lending since the risk policy is agreed they are sourcing within that policy and probably you know as long as the nbfc is sourcing into the within the risk framework the bank so, so let's take finance. an example perhaps of an nbfc that is yeah. selling me a two wheeler loan uh, right or or a car loan mm-hmm. for example right what you're mm-hmm. saying here is actually if it's a car loan for say 10 lakh rupees mm-hmm. perhaps 3 lakh rupees is coming from the nbfc and 7 lakh rupees is coming from a partner bank or something like that and okay. what would have happened is even prior to starting to look for me as a client they would have agreed that the certain civil score has got to be this income level has got to be this etc five five six different criteria and so okay. even for the nbfc to partake in that 30% of the loan they they know that the client has met all the bank's criteria also right and all exactly. the common shared criteria and that's when the high likelihood that the bank will also approve absolutely so typically we have seen the see through rate when a dsa for dsa sources 100 probably 20 gets through 80 gets rejected in a co lending model because it's a pre agreed risk framework so out of 100 probably 99 will go through so that's a kind Got of it. a difference right there there are very interesting uh, you know kind of market dynamics if you actually try to understand so on so if you look at the uh, basically the recent past so there were different models that used to exist right so we had the fldg kind of models we had the business correspondent models on one side 
of the spectrum. And then we had the other spectrums in terms of the pool buyout, right? So where the, where the banks used to buy out the assets. So banks have their targets to build their PSL. They have the PSL norms also to complete, right? So typically if they are not comfortable in building the PSL or if they do not have the certain expertise, uh, naturally they used to buy the PSL also. They used to buy the assets also. So on one hand, there were the asset purchases where the pool, asset buyout, securitization, credit enhancement, where you create a kind of an SPV, where you do a credit rating enhancement. So all of those kind of models were existing. On the other hand, we have this 100-0 kind of a models of the DSAs, FLDG, and VC. And then you have a co-origination, co-sourcing kind of model. So in an extended definition, all of this falls into a single ambit. And we are able to attack this entire, uh, entire ambit of things. And, and why, on one side, the FLDG is becoming difficult and difficult as we all understand the kind of the new regulatory tightening happening on that side. On the other side, even from the traditional pool buyout or the securitization, the RBA came up with the new norms where the where the, the individual account level information has to be maintained in the core banking system. That mm -hmm. started, so so the lines started to blur where in the kind of a classic co-lending where you are doing everything at the account level, at the borrower level, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, now even into the traditional pool buyout, also you have to do the same thing. And while in the FLDG, you cannot do that. Uh, the other interesting thing from the co-lending perspective, we would see from a leverage perspective. So NBFCs, they have a lot to gain because obviously they are able to build. Uh, and even from the overall ecosystem perspective, I would say, I think that is the fundamental um, corner that why there is a lot of momentum, right? And, and uh, across the value chain, whether it's an NBFC or a bank or the customer, all three parties win. Mm -hmm. from, an NBF, from an NBFC perspective, if a, there is a mid-size NBFC having maybe 500 crores of assets, goes to a, to, to a bank from a borrowing perspective uh, to, to basically raise the money. So the bank is going to look at their credit rating, they're going to look at the vintage, they're going to look at the rating and all of that. So most of the NBFCs will not make the cut. Even if they make the cut, the bank probably will not take more than 50 crores of exposure because they're taking a direct exposure to an NBFC. Now they might have, they might lend at let's say 12%, 13%, whatever is the number. And then an NBFC, they do not even have a direct control to what risk NBFC is taking. Right? So the NBFC might be building a book on 25% risk or 30% risk also on the same thing. So at the end of the bank has an indirect risk, but at the same time, the return is limited to the same 12-14%. And the capacity that they can give to NBFC is probably not more than 50 on 500. Come on co-lending with the new regulatory guidelines which came. So essentially the counterparty risk has been transferred from the NBFC balance sheet to the end borrower. Because now the, now the, now the same NBFC can source n number of applications and can build a large book as long as it is meeting the pre-qualified criteria. And theoretically, the same, same relationship can actually build a 2,500 crore book, wherein the NBFC has 500, bank has 2,000, the collective 2,500 crore balance sheet. So 50 could become 2,500. That is the kind of impact this relationship could do. And that is one of the reasons why the regulators and the government see as the biggest tool in terms of solving credit gap problems. Because there are a large number of fintechs and NBFCs who are good in sourcing, who have a very good distribution, who have very good collection, who have a very good underwriting, but they do not have the capital. And to raise the capital, they need to raise more capital. Because for NBFC to lend, they have to first raise, then they can lend it. There is an equity and all of those things come into play. On the bank side, banks are sitting on collectively over 135 lakh crores in assets. Almost one third. Uh, close to one third of that goes to the treasury markets. So they are already sitting on at least 10 to 15 lakh crores of dry powder. So, but, so now there has to be a framework which enables the two parties to do together. So a regulatory framework, which is now already there. And then there are, there are hundreds of technical and operational challenges. That is what we are solving for. So if we build those roads and pipes and we make this process frictionless, there's a lot of volume which can flow through these pipes. And the commercialization is certain basis points. You gave the example of the, uh, for example, payment, right? So it's, it is somewhat analogous to that. But at the same time, it's slightly deeper into that because we are not just the where we are kind of enabling moving from point A to point B, but actually it's a full service stack. So if a loan is sourced into the middleware, uh, let's say a housing loan, if it is a tenure of 15 years, during that 15 years, everything that happens into that loan, whether mm -hmm. it's an interest rate mm -hmm. reset, part prepayment, foreclosure, everything which is happening on, on, onto that is going to be managed by this middleware. So, so if, it a is, payment, if a payment processing is more of a transaction or at a snapshot here, it is really a life cycle and, and, and it's the entire video that is uh, sort of being managed uh, on your platform here because, because the relationship with the customer is, is not at a point in time, it's over a period of time. 
Absolutely. And, and because the NBFC systems are, as you mentioned, that most of the NBFCs and banks, they have their own system. Banks have their own Pinnacle, TCS, Oracle, etc. cetera. Uh, NBFCs would have their own systems like Nucleus and other systems. But these systems mm -hmm. don't talk to each other and they can't talk to each other, right? Because they have their own security policies and everything. And it's kind of, they cannot directly communicate with each other. That is where the middleware comes into play, where it kinds of gets deeply integrated on one side with banks and other side with the NBFCs. And then basically it starts, uh, you know, that it enables that the two parties who have all the willingness to do, where they have the regulatory push also, as well as where they have the, the bank's management also. It's very profitable business because, because when they get into a co-lending for NBFC, the cost of borrowing goes down effectively by at least 200, 300 basis points. And so for banks, the cost of sourcing goes down. Correct. For bank, the cost of sourcing goes down. They're able to expand the revenue also because now they're operating into a certain territory that probably they didn't do before. So they might mm. be doing at 9 to 12% of the loans. Now they're doing probably 14, 15% loans, right? So they're also having the increased ROI. They are able to expand the business into certain territories, which where the NBFCs are, you know, they are more expert, while the banks might not be, right? For example, we built an healthcare finance, right? As a kind of a new vertical only we built in for, for, for a bank in the NBFCs. So certain categories where they are not specialized, while the NBFCs are specialized. So they're able to build new capabilities. They're able to open new markets. They're able to lend at the higher rates. So bank has the direct uh, revenue incentive. The NBFCs have the incentive because the ROI almost doubles. The 15, 16% ROI becomes 30% ROI. And the customer also gets benefited because certain benefits because of the lower cost gets passed on to the customer. So he also saves 50 or 100 basis points. And, and then the entire ecosystem becomes more competitive. So if in one, if let's say 10 NBFCs start to do a co-lending, then there's a network effect. And other NBFCs mm -hmm. have to do that to, to either get the benefits or at the least become as competitive as their competition. So then the whole ecosystem starts to drive together. Sorry, we're seeing something. Yeah. No, so from a customer perspective, right, as a borrower, right? Yeah. I don't see that there are, uh, will I know that there are two parties that are coming together to give me this loan and will I have to sign contracts with each of them? Will I have to pay, you know, one third of this loan at uh, to entity X and two thirds to entity Y, you know? How will all that, you know, will it not make life of the customer more complex, whether it's a consumer or an SME? Uh, no. So whether it's a retail or is a, is a business, so for them, their life doesn't change because they are their primary point of contact is the NBFC in FinTech. So for them, mm -hmm. those are their counterparts for, for the entire servicing and collection. Everything is happening at the back end. And that's, you know, the kind of the different things that are regulatory relaxations which have come. So they don't need to get into a tri-party agreement. Right? So NBFC will be doing the demand collection for both the sides. That's where, again, the middleware comes into play because the middleware tells the NBFC that on behalf of the bank that what is the actual demand. Otherwise, the NBFC will never know what is the demand at the bank side. So the middleware passes on, collects the demand, gives that information to the NBFC. NBFC combines it, does the presentation, does the collection. Again, the middleware knows what is the collection has happened. Then it will do the splitting of the amount that this much money has come from Mr. X and, and these are the two lenders at this pre-agreed term, then again doing the splitting of it. And the entire gamut of accounting, collections, reconciliation, SOAs, all of those things are managed by the middleware. Wherein it's actually three LMS in one where it's kind of 80% is always reconciled with the bank and 20% is always reconciled with the NBFCs. So as a consumer, I'm not going to get an SMS reminder from the bank, from the NBFC, um, mm. you know, saying pay my, my repay this, repay that, etc. No, because um, so, so for a consumer experience, things... consumer experience remains same and rather better because, and then there are the different, the different modes of the co-lending also. So we can probably, you know, we can get deeper into that, but from a consumer, the, everything is being made so that at the end of the consumer gets benefit. They, they get basically the money cheaper and sooner so that their experience is better. And, and that's how the, the entire ecosystem will basically get benefited. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Now, from a, you mentioned a little bit from a regulatory and financial push, right? As well that you know, co-lending is 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 being uh, pushed a little bit. Obviously, we see the benefit to the ecosystem um, in terms of access for the customers through uh, uh, through credit, uh, through uh, NBFCs and uh, you know and uh, fintechs. So, if you were to fast forward this over the next, let's say, you know, two to four years, maybe five years, how do you see this? transforming the industry that right? you see more widespread access to credit at a more affordable credit more competitive uh, do you see you know higher risk and higher npas happening because of this 
because more people are getting into the credit uh, system. Uh, how are how is the ecosystem thinking about this? Is co lending you know seen as a way to get people into the system, but later on that the banks because this is the other question that people always have, right? Well, the banks might use this as a way to get the customer and they build up their credit worthiness, and after that the banks will you know put aside the NBFCs and the fintechs and directly work with the customers. So how do you see this shaping up? Right. No, I think uh, these things have come up, at least what we have seen and many times we have actually, you know, kind of facilitated those also that banks are typically, and there's kind of an SOP also, that banks are not doing a direct communication with the customer. So they're not sending any email or SMS to the customer because the customer ownership is remains with the NBFC. So here the role is the NBFC has or the FinTech has a role of basically customer acquisition, servicing, collection and everything. Well, bank is primarily the financial investor into the transaction. So they are behind the scenes. They are getting the biggest, they are the one of the biggest beneficiaries of the transaction. But at the same time, they are not owning the customer. And this is something which is broadly agreed upon also. I think in terms of how we see it, we see uh, obviously oh, gradually the equilibrium is going to come. What we are saying is together, if we talk about from an NBFC's perspective, we know some of the biggest NBFCs sitting on maybe 70, 80,000 crores in balance sheet. And they are looking at mobilizing at least 50% of their balance sheet towards co lending. So mm -hmm. most of the NBFCs we see would, would basically migrate from anywhere from 10% to 50% of their book. And we know actually some of the smaller NBFCs who have said we do, we will do only co lending and nothing else. So they've said we'll do 100% co lending. So we know that there are people who can move from anywhere 10% to 100% of their balance sheet towards co-lending because it is just such a lucrative business, right? So from an NBFC perspective, from a bank's perspective, we see or at a in a reasonable time, obviously, I think only the time will tell. But what we see, uh, it is reasonable to believe that 10% of the balance sheet will move towards the co-lending. So I think that is a very reasonable assumption. And we can even talk about some of the numbers. There are banks which are taking, these are the large banks. They have taken a first year target of building a 10,000 crore book each. A second year, maybe 20, 30,000. Four, five years, they're talking about a 70, 80,000 crore book. So 70, 80,000 crore book, if it's built across, let's say, seven, eight, 10 banks, we're talking about seven, eight lakh crores, 10 lakh crores of the co-lending book at the bank's end, plus the NBFC. So which is roughly about 10% of the overall balance sheet right, of the, in the, in the Indian banking system. So we think it's a reasonable to believe that it will somewhere reach there. It might, it might supersede also. If, uh, if it is being taken in the right spirit. In terms of the NP, as you mentioned, actually, if you, if you ask us, if we think that if the tool is used in the right way, it's only going to reduce the NPA. Because, because right now, what are the two prevailing methods? There's a prevailing method number one, where bank is directly giving the money to the NBFC balance sheet, and they have no control in terms of the underwriting process. They can lend the way they are lending. So they can lend the customer and charge 36% also, and the customer can default, which is essentially the hit to the bank. Or into the other mode, where they are just buying the assets in a pool basis, which is again a pretty much OPEC, because they are just going and buying 10,000 crores of assets, 1,000 crores of assets, where they were nowhere involved. Or mm. this, there is a bit of a filter, but still there is not a very fine tuning in terms of the asset quality, right? So vis-a-vis -vis into this framework, both things getting solved for. Because here the bank is directly involved in terms of who is the borrower. The borrower is being sourced in terms of the common uh, lending framework. Yes, it might be slightly riskier than what they are building it right now. But, but, but that's a kind of a replacement book because they are already doing other activities. So those activities will go down and this will go up in terms of. So overall, effectively, the risk is actually going down for the, from the balance sheet perspective. That's what Got probably it. my thought would be. Got it. I guess time will tell uh, there. Um, so let's talk a little bit, you know, from a perspective of an entrepreneur, right? Uh, so you said earlier, you know, you started in treasury and then you expanded to uh, to lending and co-lending uh, stack. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still a very young company, right? And um, uh, if you think about it, you know, generally, you know, as, as investors, you know, we look for laser focus in the company and, you know, solving one problem really, really well. Uh, and of course, you have the customers in you know, enterprise grade customers, you know, who are already using both products. So uh, what are some of the, uh, you know, first of all, you know, is there a lot of commonality and synergy in the product itself? And of course, you know, the customers are kind of uh, in the same, uh, the same customers. What are some of the benefits and challenges of, of, you know, building two products early in the life of the company? 
uh, yeah, I think we also come across this question, but uh, what what we realized that we we saw it, we saw for ourselves as a natural progression to what we were building. From day one, the idea was to build a bank infra, and bank infra is not 10% of the assets or the 30% of the asset. And while we are talking about building the infrastructure layer on top of the the uh, the, uh, the core banking layer, so then all of those things matter. So from a from a strategy perspective or vision perspective, we still the same. Yes, there would be the challenges, and I think, and that's why we did step by step. We didn't try to do things too many things at the same time. And the treasury business is something which is not well established. We have kind of able to partner with some of the biggest brands globally. Right, so where we have partnered with them, where we are able to replace actually some of the multi-billion-dollar companies in terms of their products. So there is a kind of a solid traction which has been established on the treasury side of it. It's a kind of a stable business, and and the team is also very high quality, which can which we see that we have the confidence they are basically able to run the things in more or less autopilot mode. While obviously we have a larger focus into the coal and oil, at least for the for for the near term. Because here it's more of a land grab strategy where we are trying to move very fast and cover the ground. In terms of how we evolved into a lending and co-lending space, is pretty much while in the treasury also we were building those credit risk models. We were anyways helping the banks uh, in terms of understanding the risk into what kind of corporates they are getting into and those credit risk models in terms of what could be the where could be the potential default, where could be the, those kind of things we kind of build for the treasury. Moving forward. From a target segment perspective, we see that there is a lot and lot of synergies between the two products because assets and liabilities, no matter what how we see, we can we can never keep them as two sides. That assets and liabilities are two different things. They are two sides of the same coin, right? So when we say that okay, NBFC X is our customer, that NBFC X is basically they have the liability side, which is trying to raise money either from the banks directly on the balance sheet. Or trying to raise money through the capital markets, through NCDs, commercial papers, etc. Or they're trying to raise money through co-lending. So first is the liability that comes into the balance sheet where they have access to capital, and then the asset side get built when they distribute the capital. So they are actually, you know, joined at back to back. And I think once we have this, uh, uh, the kind of the two product strategy, it actually works beautifully. And and mm-hmm. most of the times people ask ourselves only, right? Because they have a big problem into their treasury. On one hand, they have to manage the cash outflows on the liabilities. The other side, they have to manage the cash inflows on the assets. Again, all of those pieces come into play. Whether you know how to manage the cash flows, etc. And and probably the third reason to that, what I would want to add is like in an enterprise space, typically when you have the same customer, and in and no matter what, you still have you know the handful of logos. You are probably working with three hundred, five hundred large institutions in the country, right? So if it is a more of an SMB. Uh, you know, kind of a SaaS play where you know you are more of like maybe a Dropbox or Zoom. Then you would be having like one specific thing, and you would be you know, working across all the all the segments. Right? You have a single product, but into an enterprise where your segment is known and defined that these are my 300, 500 customers. You would want to build a stack which is complementary to each other, and where you have the one as an entry point, and then you have a natural upselling opportunities because you would have the dedicated account managers. You would probably 50 account managers who can manage 300 accounts. And those are talking to them on a weekly basis, and they're trying to understand, build that intelligence that what is happening at the institution, what are the customer pain points, and what is specific thing that we have which we can upsell. So we so, felt that we are not mm-hmm. building as a two different verticals, two different sales team, two different segments, two different GTMs. It's not like that. It's actually one and the same, and it's just two sides of the same as like assets and liabilities are two sides of the same balance sheet. That's how we see it. Got it. Great. So, um, uh, what plans? You know, next um, it looks like you're having some you know exciting momentum now. Uh, do you think you'd be taking uh, these products global? You know, is there a similar opportunity in other parts of the world? Yeah. So, um, I think definitely there is a global opportunity, and we are you know kind of uh, you know kind of globally incorporated. Uh, we incorporate in Singapore. But having said that, the kind of momentum we have. and the kind of massive opportunity that we are sitting in front of us i think for the next 12 months we are uh, you know heads down focused on the india opportunity the india opportunity itself is very large it's a multi billion dollar opportunity in india alone and where we see with the kind of momentum and the kind of traction we have we can get a sizable market share in this so i think once we are sort of uh, you know kind of a bit of a scaled up you know more of a matured company 
uh, I think you know probably an, another 12 months of time would be a good time when we start uh, you know kind of expansion global. But 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 if we look at in a long term or mid to long term, when you look at three years, five years horizon, I think naturally we will expand globally uh, because whether it's a, whether it's a treasury business or it's a kind of a lending uh, banking as a service or or the lending as a service is a global phenomenon. Globally, banks and fintechs and neo banks are working together, and I think uh, and and I think everywhere. The way we have positioned ourselves is we are sort of not competing with any of the uh, new age fintechs and new banks, right? So we are not sourcing ourselves. We are not lending ourselves. So we are not raising capital and building the book. So there is no conflict of interest as such. So we can technically partner and with the fintechs and the banks and just become the ecosystem enabler. So that is the kind of a position which we think can be done very much globally also. But for the next 12 months, uh, I think the focus is clearly India. And and get a very very meaningful share in, within Indian market. Wonderful. So uh, you know a lot of interesting uh, anecdotes there, Kushal, and you know I think uh, also building a company uh, and establishing yourself and your presence in the B two B world right through the pandemic. Uh, I think you know, it's it's quite an exciting um, uh, challenge in itself that uh, perhaps created more opportunity than. Uh, uh, in in hindsight, but I'm sure it must have been an intimidating uh, thing as as uh, as you had to sort of change your approach. Uh, I used to always jokingly tell people, "It's the company that takes to reach its customer has to take planes, trains, automobiles, and then walk the last hundred meters to uh, to get to the client because some of the clients were in in very small towns and uh, and then perhaps uh, even uh, uh, you know very very rural parts of India." Uh, hmm. Let's close with perhaps a couple of quick anecdotes, you know, things that surprised you either pleasantly or, you know, not so pleasantly. Um, would love to hear some thoughts and then we can uh, wrap up for today. Yeah, thanks, Anjan. So, yeah, if we kind of refresh our memory, so as you rightly mentioned, so we used to travel to the interiors of the country, right? So, and, and we were like really surprised to see uh, you know, the amount of, uh, you know, the the assets were lying and, you know, the, the kind of ineff inefficiencies were there. Because when you're looking at the metro, when you, when you talk about, uh, you know, some towns like Mumbai and Delhi, so obviously that's the kind of a center of attraction for everybody and everybody's kind of focused on those things. But it's still there were a lot of gaps which you saw into the major capitals and obviously we kind of evolved into that. But even from the, you know, the small towns, as you mentioned, right, so there, there were the incidences where we, uh, where there is even, in certain stations, even the train doesn't reach, right? So you have to actually go and then take up those things, uh, you know, the, the local commute, and then eventually reaching to the person. And then the person is probably available or, you know, says that, okay, because he has got something and then you have to wait for another 30 minutes uh, or 60 minutes to get to the next appointment. So all of those things keep happening. And I think it was fun. And, and then it started to become more interesting, you know, from the COVID times when, when we have to actually educate them also. When some, when some of the, you know, the person actually goes and tells them that, okay, this is how you have to join Zoom and, and, and this is how you can basically operate the things. So I think, uh, I think we have seen a good amount of headwind, uh, headwinds basically from the start. But I think, uh, I think the business and the team has shown a good amount of resilience and, you know, we have always come back stronger. And, and I think we would uh, continue to do the same. Got it. Uh, so anyway, I, I really appreciate your taking time out here on Ganesh Chaturthi to record this podcast. Uh, wish you and your family and your team uh, a very happy uh, festival and um, and a good uh, year ahead. And looking forward to continuing to to work together. Thank you for being on the show. Thank thank you, Sanjay. Uh, happy Ganesh Chaturthi to you and Prime family as well as to all the listeners for the podcast. Thank you so Cheers. much. Cheers. Dear listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast app for free and you'll be the first one to know when new episodes are available. Just search for Prime Venture Partners Podcast in Apple Podcast, Spotify, CastBox or however you get your podcasts. Then hit subscribe. And if you have enjoyed the show, we would be really grateful if you leave us a review on Apple Podcast. To read the full transcript, find the link in the show notes.